So now before I pass to Madonna, I would like to introduce her. And I also want to tell like, she's my role model. So I, I am really grateful for her. Like she, she come today to like help us and give us this talk and presentation. I am so happy. Thank you for coming, Madonna. Madonna is a founder and CTO of Jibu uh, Labs, author, keynote speaker, and Google developer expert for Android with over 10 years of experience building Android applications. She is also a Women Tech Maker Ambassador, Anita B.org co-chair, and a host of TED Talks with Madonna, a great podcast you should definitely follow on Spotify, and a developer who enjoys sharing her Android knowledge and teaching others how to make Android applications. So she is a rock star. Uh, <laughs> in conclusion, she is also a mother of two amazing boys. So thank you, Madonna, for coming today. So I am now passing it to Madonna, and in the end, I will pop up to like address your questions. Wow, Celine, thank you so much for the intro. I love the fact that you should say it on my rocks. Just was thinking, yay! <laughs> okay, I'm going to share my screen and we can get started with the presentation. So let me see. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, everybody we can. can see it. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. So I don't think I need to do more intro. So let's jump into it. So today we'll be talking about simplified app navigation with the Android Jetpack Compose. And um, I'm, I think I'm going to do this presentation with the assumption that many of us here know what Android is, know what Jetpack Compose is, and know what navigation is too. And if anybody doesn't know what navigation is, is the ability just to move from one point to another point in your application. Let me make sure I can click on my slides. Uh, there we go. So navigation in Jetpack Compose is pretty important because right now Google is encouraging developers around the world to start using Jetpack Compose due to its ability to make applications faster. And I've seen this like in, in fast hand because I've been building using Jetpack Compose and I've seen how Jetpack Compose actually is making the application faster, even feels faster as compared to XML. And I know most of the time we as developers have that mentality where we're thinking, why should I start fixing what's not broken? But to me, what I would say is that with every new change, there's a lot to learn definitely, but there's a lot of worthiness in it because for instance I have this application that I'll be talking to you about as I as I talk through my slides which is budget in body that I've built back in 2018 that I've been using it as my dog footing app to just continue building on my Android knowledge and also a couple of new Android concepts that come along the way now what is the importance of navigation? Again, it's all about just guiding users through your app seamlessly, just from point A to point B, as you can see there, the slide. Users are supposed to come into your app and feel comfortable navigating from point one to point B. Along the presentation too, we'll see why navigation in Jetpack Compose is way important when you utilize the new navigation in Jetpack as compared to before by a couple of simple examples, for instance, where we used to struggle a lot with back navigation when we were creating using XMLs. And I'll show you that in a couple of code there. Now, so in the past, as you can see, Android navigation involved fragment transactions, activity switching, and complex backstack management. And this is what I was talking about before, where navigating back was pretty complex and then you had to handle your back stack pretty differently with a lot of code right now that is pretty much handled especially if you're building for jetpack compose and i'll be showing you that in a few now this method i mean those methods definitely had a lot of limitations and then they were error prone and then now when jetpack compose Jetpack Compose came, it was able to solve all that. And that's why as developers, again, we always have to think about what is this new thing trying to solve for me as compared to, it's pretty hard for me to learn. Should I be learning it? Should I fix what's not broken? So the mentality should be, what is it trying to fix that was already there or what were the hurdles that we already had and how can we improve it? And sometimes I like to encourage developers that, hey, look, sometimes you don't have to build 
I mean, you don't have to fix what's not already broken. What you can do is you can always try to see if you can create a simple app and try to build the same concepts in a new app and just see how that works and then see if you get a couple of time or just maybe during your 10% time, you can work on improving your, your code base and app. Now, here's a code snippet of how it used to look before. And a simple example, as you can see there, we had fragments and then we would take, let's say, and this is actually when fragments came. So if you've been building for Android longer before fragments, you knew very well it was just few activities. I remember my first application was built out of activities. So it will be like activity one, activity two, activity three. So I would do start activity one now, move to activity B, start activity B, move to, and then when moving back, you have to move back like that, which was pretty, I mean, it was not clean, but then back then, I didn't know a better way to do it. So that to me was considered clean. But by now, Google has tried to ensure that it's much better. And as you can see here, we had an we had a menu item, and that menu item would let's say create. And this is a this is an example of let's say a bottom navigation where you would have let's say an action feed or let's say another feed. For instance, would be for instance in Budget Body we have. Um, transactions and then we have settings and then we have budgets and then we have tasks so navigating through that sometimes can get very complex especially if inside those particular fragments you're opening other fragments right like you're navigating like let's say for instance in settings you're navigating to another screen and then inside that screen in setting you're navigating to another screen how do you move back all the way back to where you're supposed to be which is your entry point now uh general compose navigation is a game changer in your development. And it's not just about UI component, it also brings the navigation into the modern age, which is super exciting. Now, Jetpack Compose navigation also brings all the benefits of Jetpack Components library to compose, and also it simplifies navigation and handles complex routing, which we'll see. So let's talk about common types of navigations before we even dive into how we can write this code. Now, uh, for example, you can use, let's say, we have explicit intent, we have implicit intent and navigation components. And as you can see there, I have defined what those are. That is explicit intent is where you navigate from one activity to another within an Android app. Um, implicit intent requires an action from another app component without specifying the target component. Example, when you're opening a, a web page, and then navigation component that is just library provided by Android Jetpack that simplifies navigation between different destinations in your app, such as fragments, or activities. Now, we have the bottom navigation view, which is what we will look into today, because that's another form of navigation in Android, which is pretty popular. I feel like many applications that I've used so far utilize this a lot. I know back in the days we used to have the drawer navigation to also being very popular, but I feel like right now people don't use a lot of drawers. I feel like the tab and the bottom navigation is more popular right now. So as you can see here, that is just bottom navigation is where you have, let's say, for instance, I mentioned in budget and body, we have the transaction settings and budgets and tasks. And then if we wanted to do a tab layer, we can actually do have two on top. So I think something I would also encourage is ensure that when you're building for Jetpack Compose, try to follow the material you guidelines and if they're way documented and it's it's much better when you just follow them as compared to when you build blindly without knowing. They're kind of like, um problems you might encounter later. Now, uh, we also have a couple that we'll not touch on, but I just wanted to mention them so that if you're here today and you've never heard of them, you might look into them. So we have the Fragment Manager where you can dynamically add, repress, or remove fragments. And I mentioned this because I do know a couple of applications are still building with a legacy. So it's just good if you're a new developer and you've never heard about this, you can also look into that. And then there's view pages. So if you had a view page, is a UI command that allows users to swipe left and right to navigate between different fragments. And then the toolbar or action bar, definitely that's also navigation. No, when, when you have a toolbar on top and then you have an action bar that tells you like it has an arrow, move back, that's also navigation. Now, as I mentioned today, we'll be looking at bottom navigation. So we'll be looking at a couple of code snippets. So we'll be walking through this code base, this code when we look at it. So this code defines a silt class destination with four specific destination represented as singleton objects inside the class, as you can see. Now, the first line 
we find a sealed class, as you can see, sealed class destination. And then we pass in the route, the icon and the title. Now, if you're a visual person, you will visualize that here. In this destination, we have a route, which is where we'll be destinating to. We have an icon, which is what will showcase that this particular destination has this icon. And then the title is just to tell that, hey, this icon and the title mean this. And as you, you'll see that there in the next object, which is the transaction. Now, the sealed class in Kotlin are used for several purposes, mainly to create a restricted class hierarchy that is useful in a variety of scenarios. Let's say limited inheritance, grouping related types, or even pattern matching, if you've, if you've heard about sealed class. And you can also look into this more. Now, Inside the destination, as you can see, there are four objects, right? And these four objects, defi they're defined by the object keyword. You see, I put the object there, object transaction, object budget, object task, object setting. So these objects are essentially, you can think of them as, uh, as singletons, instances of destinations class, each representing a specific destination. For instance, transaction represents the transactions, destination is a route called the transaction. And then a resource, which as you can see there, I pass in the icon, which is the transaction drawable, and then the title, which when you see, you'll see a transaction and like that for the, for the rest. Now, we also include a companion object and this companion object block defines just a static property called to list, which is a list containing all defined destination objects. Here is the transaction object, tasks, and settings. And this just allows us to easily access and iterate through all the variable destinations in your code when we want to do that, and which I'll show you later in the part where we'll call this. Now, let's connect the dots, which is the important part. So now what we've created first, we've just created our destination because that's how you create it in, in Jetpack Compose. You need to define a destination first. Now, when connected the dot, you'll notice that, and this is actually an app you can build completely if you, if anybody wants this slide and they want to build this particular section, it's fully buildable and you can run and see it in action. So here we have a nav controller, as you can see. And that nav controller is just part of Android navigation component library and is used for managing navigation within the app. Now, as you can see, I called something called the scaffold. A scaffold is, uh, you can think about it as a composable function used to create a basic app layout structure. That's how I think about it. So it typically just includes an app bar, as you can see, or a bottom bar. As you can see here, we're using a bottom bar, So, but you can use it to just include also an app bar. And I feel like this is why I've been telling more people to, to try Jetpack Compose out because it's so cool. Because before you would have to go to the XML and create a top bar there, which would be so many lines of XML. But right here, you just call a scaffold. And in the scaffold, you can define your app bar or your bottom app bar or other URL elements commonly found inside the app layout. Now, in our case, it's just being used to create a layout with a bottom navigation bar, as you can see there. The bottom the bottom bar, and then we pass that lambda, which has the bottom navigation bar. And inside the bottom navigation bar, as you can see, we have the nav controller. We used to remember nav controller to just remember its state. And then, as you can see there in the app items, we passed destination dot to list. Remember the companion object created that had to list? We pass it there. Now. App item, this is just a list of destination objects, and that's why we pass their destination dot to list. Now, let's talk about the content block. The content parameter is used to define the main content of the scaffold. In this case, it's a composable function that takes a padding parameter, as you can see, which represents the padding applied to its content. And then inside, as you can see here, we have a box and a, a box composable, which is used to create a box-like layout. When you think about just, it's just defined as it is a box, the box-like layout. And then inside the box, as you can see, we have app navigation, and then we pass in our nav controller. So what we will be looking at next is now the app navigation. So, cause this is a function that we, we need to build. So we've not built it yet. So we'll be building it next. 
Now let's look at, uh, oh, wait. So before we also built the, nav the bottom navigation bar. So we also need to look in that composable function, how it looks. And then next we will look into our content section and see how that looks. So let's look at our bottom navigation. So I know this is a lot of code. You might be looking at it and you're like, wow, madam, this is a lot. How am I expected to know this at a go? I don't expect you to know all this at a go. I just expect you to know a couple of things here. For instance, when we create this composable function bottom navigation bar, we pass in a nav controller. And as you've noticed before here, that's what we pass on top there, the nav controller, which is, as you see, it's just a nav controller that remembers the nav controller state. And um, we need to pass now the app items. What are the app items? Again, this is the companion block that we created inside our destination, which loops through our destination. As you can see, it's a list. That's why we have to pass the list there and pass the and pass the, the type as the destination. Now, the bottom navigation, however, the one that we call that is provided to us by by the navigation components. So we should be able to just set the color there and I set the color so you can set the color, the any color that you want. And then inside there, as you can see, we need to now handle our backstack entry. So we use the current, uh, as you can see there, found bottom navigation bar takes all that. The nav controller is just an instance of the nav controller itself that is used to manage your navigation within the app. And then the app item, again, as we mentioned, it's just the list of destination. Now, the val nav backstack entry by nav controller, and then we pass that current backstack entry as state, this line obtains the current backstack entry using the current backstack entry as state. So that's why I think building in Jetpack Compose right now is so easy, because as you can see here, it's straight ahead given to you that, hey, when you do this, handle my backstack for me. And that's how you do it. It's pretty straightforward. Now, we also have another part that's important, which is the var current route. And as you can see there, we define where the destination is gonna start, which is this line here just tells us that extract the current route, which is the destination from the backtrack entry, if available, and it will be used to determine which item in the bottom navigation bar is currently selected, which I think is also very important. And then when we go and now call the app items dot for each, what we do is we're just iterating through those list of destination and then setting what we need. As you can see, the other part is a little bit self-explanatory where we put the label, just the, the label there is just a text and then item dot title. So here, for instance, in this part of code, if the item, let's say was transaction, it will be transaction item. When it's selected content color, it will be white and selected it will be that particular color that we set there. And then we always set to show label. You can decide to hide this so you can play around with this part. And then selected current route, we need to make sure that the route is also matching to the way it should. And then finally, when on click, you can do your function. Currently, I'm not doing anything, but when you click, it can definitely do something if you wanna do more. And as you can see here, this is how I, define what I'm doing in the on click, which is just on click specifies the action to take when the item is clicked, right? Like it is, it uses the navigate, nav controller dot navigate method to just navigate to the corresponding route. And it provides additional navigation configuration options if we need to, as you can see there, nothing more to be done there. And then finally, and I've been speaking a lot, but let's look at now finding the app navigation. So this is how it looks, I know pretty clean and pretty straightforward. So now we've done writing all that code, all that stuff that needed to be done in logic. What we do finally is just create a function and call it app navigation. And then now we pass the host controller. And then as you see there in the nav host, we have the nav controller. And then the start destination, we always want to start at the first one that's beginning in the bottom navigation. For instance, here we said in my budgeting app is a transaction. So we'll set the transaction and then the budget, and then the task, and then the setting. So this will navigate without an, an issue. And then you can move back as you want. And if you want to make a more complex structure where inside, let's say, the transaction composable functions, you have more navigation, you, handling that should be pretty easy. And then voila, this is what you would have. For instance, if you 
take the code and just build it. This is what you should be able to have. As you can see there, when it's not selected, it shows it's not selected. When it's selected, it shows it's selected and you're able just to move through. So the budget, the task, the screen, those ones, I've not shown the part of it, but you can just create a text inside those particular functions that I've just called in the app navigation. And then finally, so that's how you build bottom navigation now in the new modern way and also simplifying app, app navigation. But it will be unfair to talk about navigation without talking about deep linking, which I think is something that many of us do. So deep linking allows you to just read or redirect or just direct users to a specific location or content within your app. Now, it can be directly, let's say, from an external source, such as maybe a web URL or a notification, you know, when you send a notification and somebody has to click, or maybe another app too. And it's also very important. No, we have a couple of types of deep links, which is explicit again, it just opens an app and then implicit, just as defined before. And it's important to know how you can use this. So here in this code, I just showcase a pseudocode on how you can try to implement deep linking in our modern way. But as you can see here, it's just a pseudocode that I created here. And you need to definitely define that. And then finally here, as you can see, when you're passing data between screens, you should be able to just scan nav controller dot navigate and then the details and then the item ID where you want to do. And then finally, we will look into conditional navigation, which is just navigation when you're allowed to navigate pretty easily. And this is pretty straightforward. And this is, let's say, if you're logged in, navigate to the dashboard. This is also a pseudocode and the else navigate to login. So pretty straightforward when it's a conditional. So you just add your condition and you tell it to navigate where you want to. And then I also want to talk about a little bit about custom navigation in Jepa Compose. And I feel like this is way easier now as compared to before. And I feel like the biggest challenge that we encounter right now as engineers is building a custom navigation for an app that's already in legacy can be pretty tough, but building custom navigation for an app that's freshly built from the beginning, it's pretty straightforward and easy. So depending on your app's requirement, you can implement custom navigation solution using gestures, animation or any other UI elements pretty easily. So just wanted to motivate people who want to try custom navigation, which can be pretty cool. And then finally, I know there's a lot of advanced navigation flows that many people have used, especially in apps. And here, as you can see, this is a pseudocode of how well, you would have a lot of, let's say, complex here, as you can see, it's, it's a similar code to what we had before, but with more complexity, for instance, here, as you can see, when you say composable home, we have a home screen. And then when item clicked, you tell it navigates to that particular ID based on a link that was provided or based on a bundle that was provided. And then finally, navigation components advantages include simplified navigation, navigation setup, safe ags, deep linking support. And then something that I wanna mention a lot, which is I like tooting the horn on this is just being able to handle the back stack pretty easily, right? The back stack keeps track, which is pretty nice right now because we struggled a lot with this. And I know myself, I did that. And then automatically handling of back stack operation when using JPA Compose is pretty easy. And now developers can customize their backstack behavior, you know, that is something that we didn't have the power to do before. And then finally, just, you can also do conditional navigation to direct users, direct screens based on whether they're logged in or out, logged in or not. And this is just also when you're trying to build complex too. And that's it. So custom transition. Also, I would like to mention a little bit about custom transitions, which is you can always find ways, how find ways in your application to make custom transitions. And that's easier too with Jetpack Compose. And even though I didn't create examples on this, definitely it's it's easily and doable. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marona. That was fast. <laughs> um, okay. Thank How long so did we take? I thought we went over 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, no, we had one hour, so no problem. Mm -hmm. uh, 
we can do some like Q and A's, uh, not like specific to navigation maybe, but I have some questions in my mind to ask you. <laughs> So also in the chat, please let us know like if you have any questions like Android related, Android career related, uh, because Madonna had a lot of experience in Android. I think she will be a valuable asset for us. So if you have any questions, please let us know. In the meantime, I want to ask you, I know that you recently published your book uh, about yes. Jetpack Compose in Android and everything. So why do you choose like Jetpack Compose? Like uh, what, what sparks in you to write about a Jetpack Compose like book? <laughs> yeah, so that's a very good question. And that's why even my talk is just showcasing how navigation in Jetpack Compose is pretty easy. You saw the way in just those three slides, you're able to build a complete navigation. Handling how, let's say the transactions or the budgets or the settings navigate that's pretty easy too because you handle that inside the, those components but when you think about building for Android apps back in the days it was pretty tough like I showed a code in the beginning where you would need to create a fragment transaction and in the transaction you'd start handling each back stack and then once you go to those classes you'd again handle each back stack and then you would end up in a weird state and loop so to me, seeing how Jetpack Compose just comes in and is like, you know what, developers, we've heard you. We've seen your struggles and we see how actually we can advance. And that's what we decided to do. To me, is 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 really important because when you think about it, it's like a house, right? You might live in your house for so long. I mean, you still love your house, but then one day you're like, somebody comes and tells you, you know what? I really like the fact that you've been very patient living in your house, but I want to award you with a new house will you say no to the new house i know a couple of people would but i wouldn't just a, just a simple example so to me what sparked the interest is the fact that it handles a lot of some of the pro problems that i used to experience as a developer before pretty easily and i feel like the future developers i have a pretty good time where they come in there will be they'll find pretty easy time just knowing how to build upon some of the logic and concepts that already exist so it's just a given. Now, I want to also acknowledge the fact that there's a lot of learning curves, especially for developers who are still develop who are still building, let's say, using XML. It's not easy. For instance, I encounter issues from time to time when I try to build Jetpack Compose in an existing legacy code. There's a lot of problems that you'll encounter because some things will not work as you expect them to work. Some things might not be in compatible with what like the backward compatibility feature is not maybe yet well implemented yet to where you're like oh I didn't know I would get this problem or this loop so then you go back again and you're like should I just do it with XML or should I just what do I do you might have to end up doing it with XML or just asking a question and maybe if you're lucky and somebody answers it you get the solution but otherwise I would say if it's a new app from start to finish Go compose way. It's pretty straightforward and easy to build upon. But if it's still a legacy app, just listen to your leadership and what they they think is the best. And yeah, follow that. Thank you for your answer. Also, we have uh, some questions in the Q and A section right now. I will ask okay. you. Uh, Cassandra asks, uh, what to watch out when working with JPEG navigation? Another way of thinking: what mis mistakes does uh, developers make when working with it? Uh, so, so, so say that again. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, like she's she asked like what can be watch out like when we are working with Jetpack yeah. Compose navigation. Like what are the mistakes we can encounter when we are working with that? Yeah. So I feel like the biggest challenge you can encounter, especially with the navigation, is when you're building and you're passing arguments. Because uh, for instance, I know where this those actions. Let's say. Navigation introduced the actions where you can just explicitly say find nav controller dot navigate and then you pass the action ID. I feel like I've not experimented much with how that would work with Jetpack Compose because so far what I've been able to build is using Jetpack Compose purely with the navigation itself. But I feel like the backward compatibility of being able to move, move back and refactor some of that code to just like move without creating that those route will be pretty steep and pretty tough because I mean you have to define those destinations because don't forget their point in in fragments you cannot open frag I mean I did try to Google the other day I noticed that 
that I think there's a solution that came up because people encounter that problem where you cannot navigate like the way we navigate in fragments. Like let's say find nav controller dot da 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 ID and then you pass in the ID. You cannot do that. So I think there's another situation where they've found a solution where they you would call the Android view itself, which is an object. That I, I mean don't quote me on this, but I don't feel like that's clean because you're passing an entire object that to open like a screen. I feel like that was too much, but I feel like that definitely should be handled. So that's one of the backside I've seen where if your app is legacy, but if your app is not legacy, then creating the destination is pretty straightforward, pretty easy. And also just pinpointing that, hey, from this destination, I want to navigate to this destination and then moving back. So you can create one object navigation handler that can handle your entire application navigation. And you just showcase that, hey, this is the route. And everywhere you go to that route, like when it's complex, you just pull that route and say, yeah, this is the route I wanna go to. And it will, it will take you there. On the backstack, you just use the backstack entry. There's a backstack entry that you, and then you'll pass in a function back. And then you can also handle or solve that using what is it called view models where you pass in like on back what do you want to do or what do you want to show and then it will handle all that yeah thank you so much also cassandra uh thank you for asking these questions uh please think your questions in the meantime but i will ask you another question like mm -hmm. as you said like jetpack compost has like a lot of like easy way to like build rather than the xml but like, do you have any advice like when learning the Jetpack Compose, like what should we like watch out? Like not specific to navigation, but like when the learning curve like can be hard. Yeah. Uh, and for the new developers also, like how can we like achieve this learning curve and learning um, impossible? Sometimes like I feel like the Jetpack Compose can be hard to learn yeah. uh, and like, Put, because the information is really different, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, like, how can we, like, achieve that? How can we pass that? That's a very good question. And I feel like there's never a right answer to that when I think about it, because we all learn differently. For instance, my strength is a learn through implementing. So that's why I have, I, I love budgeting buddy app, where I'm able to go break it and make it just using the same concept. So what I'm doing in budgeting buddy is, they've brought up new Jet Jetpack Compose, right? So what I did is I went and rewrote the entire app again. I mean, the app still works, it's on the Play Store. I've not pushed any updates yet, but I created a branch and I was like, okay, I want to refactor this work to start using the new navigation. And I wanna refactor this work to start using Compose. So I create small tickets just for me. Jira is free when you're using it. <laughs> so I create small tickets. And I'm like, okay, so step one, I want to learn how can I convert this entire class to Jepa Compose? Can I build the screens? And then I see the screens I have, and then I start building them again in Jepa Compose. And then the way I pass components before, it's definitely different. So I start seeing, okay, before I connected it this way, now I can connect it this way. And I feel like that helps me a lot to learn because then I have something that's working that I can break and make at the same time. Because I know if it doesn't work, I'm like, oh, this code base here worked. Why did it work? What am I doing different? And then how can I make it fit in Jetpack Compose? So that's how I learn. I feel like that's how I learn myself, like just doing it and experimenting in it. Now for you, it may be different. It might be just watching a tutorial, might be watching a code lab or following through code labs. So I would say find a way in which you find it easier to learn. If it's through a project to like what I mentioned, do that, create a project, make it stable, and then break it from time to time and just try new concepts. But that can also be tough. Somebody who doesn't have time to do that because my project occurred when I had time. Because right now I don't think I can create a project from start to finish because I feel like my time is limited. But now that I already have it, it's really helped me a lot. So I would say find something that works for you and try to implement in those strategies and ideas and see how you can improve. And also when you don't feel like doing it, don't do it. Because I feel like if you force yourself, it never works. You have to do it when you want to do it. That's the way I, I that's my mantra. I'm going to do it when I want to do it because I feel like my body and my mind is telling me do it. So I'm going to do it. But if my mind, my mind and my body is telling me don't do it, I want to do it because I'll, I'll slug like I'm not doing it. <laughs> 
definitely I agree with you. Like, I think people need to decide, like, first, like, why do I need to learn JPEG Compose? Like, yeah. what will, like, do for me? And after that, like, if you are doing it out of curiosity, like, you can easily learn, yeah. as you said. And I love the idea, like, <laughs> to break it and learn it. I think that's a really great way to learn. Yeah, that's how I do it. That, I mean, that's how I've been doing it with the, with my app. Just go in there, creating a branch. I don't break the main because I'm like, oh, if I break main, it will take me forever <laughs> to fix it. <laughs> so I don't break main. I break a different branch. I'm like, check out a branch. Break this. If you see the number of branches I have on Budget and Buddy, you'll be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun. It helps me a lot. Definitely. Thank you so much. Um. Yeah, also Cassandra. Yeah, yeah. I also agree with you, Cassandra. Like Jetpack mm -hmm. is a bit like another language. <laughs> so I also yes. struggle with that in the beginning too. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to ask you another question. In the meantime, like sure. if you have questions, please like write it in the chat. Uh, like you are a Google developer expert. So do you have mm -hmm. any advice to an Android developer who wants to be a Google developer expert? So for anybody that wants to become a Google developer expert, definitely is, first of all, I think the requirements say you need to have five years of experience building that product. And then after that, you just need, excuse me, to showcase that you've been working in the Android field and in the community, like supporting others, giving webinars or talks, and also just being involved in part of the community. Something that like I like to also mention is that you have to do it for the right reasons and it has to be passionate. Because to me, when I was doing what I was doing, I didn't even know the GDE program existed. You get what I mean? Like I didn't even know that was a thing until somebody told me, wait, do you know there's actually a group called expert that you can do what you're doing, even in a bigger region? I was like, what? What do you mean? And then, she, I mean, the way she told me, she the way she told me was like, it was an elite group of a couple of people selected. Like getting in is a no-no. I was like, uh, I don't need to then know about that if getting in is, is even a it's a problem. So I was like, never mind. But mind you, so after that, so I did not, I never applied or did anything. Cause I mean, I'm like, it's an untouchable group. So I'm not joining. But to my surprise, Caitlin from Google, she reached out to me back in the days and she was like, hey, Madonna, I think you would be pretty good for a program we are running and we would like to include you in our program. I was like, oh, okay, this is cool. And then through that program, I was like, oh, we know you've been doing a lot of work. You should be a GDE. And then boom. So this guy called Kyle Paul, like just said, recommended me for that. He He's a Googler. He works for Google. And that's how I got in. So it was pretty easy. So I think what I've learned is that if you want to become a Googler, just continue doing what you're doing and for the good reason. And after that, people will see what you're doing and then they will reach out to you. But if you want to apply to, there's a process of apply, applying. You can just go ahead and apply directly and then become an expert. And then finally, just continue your community support, which I think is very important. Now, there's another way of also becoming an expert now that is through Women Developers Academy. I am a mentor this year. I mentored five women. So I think they just graduated. So I'm hoping we will get a couple of GDEs because we don't have so many of women GDEs anyway. So that's how it would be. So if you want to use the route of Women Developers Academy, I highly recommend that too. Because what the program does is just, you become a developer academy where you're, you're helped with the ways to make good content how to become confident at speaking and all that and then you're recommended by google which is easy because I, I know a couple of people have done the interview and, and failed a couple of times because the interview is four rounds so it it does take long yeah thank you so much for your answer i also want to ask you like you are doing a lot <laughs> <laughs> like really a lot so like yeah. how do you manage your time because i think this is really important for us as developers to like we really need to like stay up to date and also in the meantime like we have jobs and our lives too so yeah. how do you handle this and you are also doing like podcasts like 
<laughs> a lot of things like the book writing and everything so like how do you handle it like how do you create time for your personal development and what way you like choose mm -hmm. your personal development like maybe as you said like you have a project so do you use your project to like stay up to date with the new technical things like what is your race now that's a very very good question but a couple of few, few things that I want to mention. I think people are different, first of all. And I, I don't know. This is a question that I, I started wondering. I, I I never thought, like, if you come from my country, people don't ask that. Like, how? Because you have time for things you like. But here in America, I've noticed people, like, there's that struggling with the time management. But number one, you need to know what's taking up most of your time. Because I feel like understanding what really takes up a lot of your time is very vital. Like how many, how, sorry, like how much time do I spend, let's say, in, on social media? In a day, you have eight hours, right? From morning to evening, you work during the day. And if you work from home, it's easier because, I mean, I don't expect somebody that's working from home to be coding eight hours. That's a lot. If you work from home, you, cut, you code for four hours and then the other four hours, either you're in a meeting and then you're done, you're resting, you're eating lunch, you're moving around, just good four hours. Now, the other hours, when you look at, when you look at, I was talking to my mentee the other day and I was just asking her because she asked me the same question that she told me she's struggling a lot with time management. And I asked her, how, how long do you stay on your phone? And then we looked together, like, I want to see how long you stay on your phone, like daily average. And then it said eight hours. And I was like, wait, you you own your phone eight hours a day. I mean, do you know what that means? If you own your phone eight hours a day, that means, of course, you. Because the way it counts, the day is until nighttime. So you're like, most of the time you're spending like on your phone. Do, 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 do. And we we had a session on that. We talked about a lot. We talked a lot about that. So at the end of the at the end of the day, what I told her is that look, know how to balance your time. For instance, myself, I am not I'm not a I'm not a doom scroller. Like if I go to Instagram or LinkedIn, if I posted something, and that's why I might I might miss a couple of mini posts because if I posted something and just people comment, yeah, I'm gonna go re respond, and then I'm out. The same with LinkedIn. I, sorry, in Instagram, I posted something, somebody commented, I'm going to go check and I'm out. Or if I'm looking, it's just a couple of seconds and then I'm out. For some reason, my attention span for my phone is so small. So that gives me time to do other things. For instance, create my talk. Or, so my podcasts, I don't do them during the week, the weekdays. No, I do them during the weekends. And I do have one person that helps me, like, let's say, schedule the post and everything else. But otherwise, recording 30 minutes, editing takes maybe let's say one hour or less now the other time is me working and for writing my book I am not a procrastinator I know I said I realized that was my superpower because I'm like if I'm set to do something Selena Selena sorry I will do it because it's in my mind that I have to do it so it's it's better I do it and I'm done with it I'm like keep pushing because I still know at the back of my, so it's just accountability like but I don't do good with gym though I, I need that mindset for the gym. <laughs> well, I do exercise, but I'm like, the gym, I struggle to go. I'm like, wait, you, I don't struggle with other things, but I struggle. So I think it's the interest. So I feel like this interests me more. This doesn't stress me as much. So, so I, just to sum this answer up is, first of all, look at what is killing your productivity. How much time are you spending on, let's say, your phone and the other things? Are they worth it? Because as long as you're doing something you, lo you love, Celine, I think it's worth it. If also your work is, let's say, like a social media marketer, I mean, you don't expect them not to be on the phone throughout. No, that's their job. And that's OK. But if you want to achieve a lot, let's say you want to draft your talk, you can draft your talk if you're always on your phone. Like what time? Because you're saying, OK, I'll do it tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes. Out, no, I'll do it. You, last minute is when you're like, oh, my goodness, I didn't know. Start early. Finish it then you'll have more time for the things. And again, I like to acknowledge it's not easy. It's a practice, you know, it's something we practice. Definitely, definitely. I agree with you. Also, like the self-discipline is the key here. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for your answers. <laughs> I always I like, 
get a lot of inspiration from you so I think this all this answer is also like helps me a lot too so thank you so much <laughs> in the chat like that's me yeah that I mean that's me most of the time I'm like oh wow I don't really want to what is it called I don't want to procrastinate because I feel like it will I mean I'm meant to do it I think who's gonna do it if I don't so I have that mindset I know it's due. It's my work. It's the same with work. I finish my work as needed. I do other things because I'm like, it's due. I have to do it. Don't wait until last minute. Definitely. Thank mm. you so much. And also with the gym, I think this is the silver lining of all. <laughs> you are doing so much. So, <laughs> You know, that's a, you said something that I, I just, it, I, it's a silver lining. Like the gym thing, for some reason, I'm like, oh my God, it's... <laughs> I think it's the interest. If I get somebody that can show me it's interesting, I'll go. <laughs> I think this is not interesting. Like the gym is not interesting. I agree with you on that. <laughs> thank you so much, Madonna. It was really good to have you here. And also thank you for your knowledge you shared with us about navigation today. Thank you everyone who is attending. So <laughs> do your podcast at the gym <laughs> Cassandra around <laughs> well it's gonna be noisy Cassandra are you kidding me everybody there is pulling weights <laughs> and then banging the weights down <laughs> I also apologize for I noticed the session was short because I thought it was 30 minutes I don't know why I thought it was 30 minutes so I made 30 minutes <laughs> No problem, no problem. We uh, had a great Q&A session <laughs> with yeah. you too, so it was nice. Thank you again for joining. Thank you everyone who joined today. Uh, you can see the recording in a few days.